Hello. <laughs> Welcome. So I had the honor and privilege to actually visit Disney World this year, and I hadn't gone in about 20 years, so it was a big occasion for me. And as I walked through the gates of the Magic Kingdom, it astonished me how technology has changed how I visit this park. And I walked through the gates, I scanned my fingerprints. I don't know why, but they are. They're tracking something and they know who I am. It's really magical. And then as I, as I walk left through the gates, I saw this little, this little sign about this game that you can explore. And if you step through, you actually get this deck of augmented reality cards, and you become the hero, and you're fighting these villains all throughout the park. And who doesn't want to be a superhero, James? I mean, I do. Absolutely. Yeah. And uh, it, so it was really mind-blowing. And then it, then it got really intriguing, because I downloaded the app. And the app for Disney World's awesome, because I can see the queue lines. You know, how long is it to get to Star Tours? Because that's all I really care about, really. I mean, there's like 50 different endings now, right? I mean, I want to ride this all day. So if it's five minutes, I'm going to run right over it. They have a nice graph. It's really colorful. I can see everything in the park. But there's one thing that I noticed that the mouse was missing from my experience, which was giving me contextual information about where I'm at. Sure, it's good that I have a map, but what if I go to Star Tours 10 times a day, like I do anyways, right? I want to go in and have him, the mouse, be able to say, well, James went to Star Tours 10 times the first day. As I walk through the gates on day two, wouldn't it be amazing if I got a notification on the <laughs> app telling me, hey, Star Tours is only a five-minute line. And in fact, you know that you love it so much, there's a 10% discount on all those awesome plush Ewoks because I'm going to buy all of them anyways. And we all know, James, that you really love to receive notifications. Oh, I, that's why I bought the Moto 360. Absolutely. Just love notifications for days. So the, the power to do this is available today. And that's what iBeacons are. And that's what we're here to talk to you about today, iBeacon. So what's an iBeacon? An iBeacon is, according to Apple, a new class of low-powered, low-cost transmitters that can notify iOS devices of their presence. Seems kind of complex. That's a, that's a fancy way of saying something. Yeah, let's, let's, what does this really mean? It means that these are devices that can notify apps of their proximity. And subsequently, it enables location awareness scenarios that weren't possible before. Now, of course, that's a really cool meaning. And then we've kind of decided to try to summarize it and say what Apple says. But for developers, I think it means two distinct things. First and foremost, it's a device. These are the devices that you place around that will transmit data to your application. And then for developers, to integrate it into our apps, we have an API that our apps can use uh, to detect these devices. That's really important. Two things. That's what an iBeacon is. So there's a lot of devices out there that be can become mm -hmm. a beacon or are a beacon that we can purchase. Now, Mike here loves iOS. He's, I can say, of the stage, definitely the iOS fanboy. So tell the people how amazing Apple is yeah. in their iOSness. I can do that all day. <laughs> Apple is amazing. And they were very forward-thinking with iOS and iBeacons. They introduced them in iOS 7, and as James mentioned, they actually made it so that all the iOS devices in the world could become the beacon, so that they, they could actually be a beacon. They made a very simple API in iOS 7 and now in iOS 8 to turn this on, and it's made specifically for iBeacons um, in iOS. So it's pretty great. But can they do this on Android? Well, the story's a little complicated. Google wasn't quite as forward-thinking, per se, as Apple. You don't say. No, uh, it happens. <laughs> happens, you know. What are you going to do? But they did think about it now. All right, well, we have, you know, we have some ability to do this. Almost. Well, it's actually an Android L developer preview to turn your Android device into a Bluetooth low-energy peripheral, uh, which would actually expose it as an iBeacon. So we're almost there. But I think one thing that Mike and I can agree on is that uh, what developers are going to care about are these cute little devices. Sure. And there's tons of them out there. And you can see just a few examples here uh, from different companies. And these are distinct devices that you'll be purchasing for cheap amounts of money uh, and placing them around. So you don't have to go buy an iPhone to actually turn it into uh, an iBeacon device. And, and I would say more than anything, 
there's a company called Estimo, and you've probably seen the beacons all around Evolve, but Estimo has this new concept called Nearables, and there's these tiny little stickers that cost less than $10 a piece uh, that uh, will be used for iBeacon technology, and that comes out at the end of the month. I think this is kind of where we're going, because uh, iBeacons have really been around since iOS 7, so it's kind of come a long way to these little tiny itty-bitty devices that can do something like this. So really, Mike, I mean, I know since you wrote everything about how they work and beginning with on the blog and you love iOS and the implementation, tell everybody how they work. Well, not quite everything, but, but, but a little bit. Um, so iBeacons work with a technology called Bluetooth Low Energy, Bluetooth LEs, as you'll see it termed. And the, the key thing to take away about Bluetooth Low Energy, there's a lot of specs here, and you see some differences with classic Bluetooth. But the big thing is, in the uses that we're, we're talking about here today, is the power consumption. Bluetooth Low Energy uses considerably less power than classic Bluetooth. So that means these devices can be placed and used for, for substantial amounts of time. Yeah, I mean, right here we're looking at 1 milliwatt to 0.01 milliwatts, and there's a lot of fun stats, as we like to call them. But this means not only the devices uh, are low energy, so they're transmitting and can last for a long time, but the power used to communicate with other devices that are receiving them is low energy as well. Exactly. Yeah. So more about the details of how Bluetooth low energy works. So here we have this flow chart that explains, um, uh, walking you through all the details of Bluetooth low energy that nobody cares about. So let's go past that. <laughs> um, but what you really care about is the information that iBeacons transmit. And it transmits three key pieces of information, a UUID and a major and minor version numbers. So this is the beacon itself. You'd have a, the UUID, for example, would be used in a scenario such as, say, a store, a retailer. It would then identify all, you could identify all of the beacons for that retail, the retailer throughout the world. The major number, the major version number, could be used to identify the individual locations of that retailer, the individual stores, and then you could use some, the minor number for something like identifying the beacons in a particular department within that store. And that's it. And that's what, these, that's what an iBeacons transmit. So three pieces of data. Three pieces of data. That's it. That's it. Three pieces. That's it. Yeah. So really important to realize that what iBeacons do not do is they don't send push notifications to a device. They do not track users. Nope. All right. Here's an iBeacon, here's an Estimo beacon. What they do is you place them right there, and, and that's it. They, they're just, I'm here. I'm here. Somebody find me. Right? They're transmitting this data just over and over at intervals. Um, it could be a second, milliseconds, it depends. But honestly, they're just, that's it. That's all they do. They don't know to do anything else, because that's all they're programmed to do. And that's it. So that's a really clear distinction uh, as, to, as to what they do not do. It's very important. I think it's a common misconception. Sure. So I, I love the API. I think using and implementing iBeacons into our apps, because an iBeacon, a device is fine, but it's integrating it into our applications to detect it, right? And that's the important part. And this API is just wonderful to use. So there's two important aspects. There's region monitoring and ranging. And I'm first going to talk about region monitoring, because it's very intriguing. So with region monitoring, there we go. What I love about this API, if I look at it from a department store, it's when I enter and exit a region. And a region, we can specify as a developer with our UUID and our major and minor numbers. And we can ask for a combination of those three. So maybe it's just uh, um, the UUID is evolve. So when did I enter the Hyatt? When did I enter Evolve? I can actually get a notification in my application if I've registered for it, and I can display something to my users, like, welcome to Evolve, right? I, this works in, on a lock screen, in a background. I could do anything at this point, and I could do fine grain to say what happens when they walk into uh, this room here specifically. Now, your application at this point could do a whole bunch of things, uh, such as uh, see what session's on and then say, hey, welcome to this session, blah, 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 right? Or in this instance, what we're seeing here is you've entered the department store and there's a coupon, right? So we've implemented that functionality. Now, the ranging is really awesome, though, and that's what we're going to really be focusing on today. Is we take those same properties, those UUIDs, those major and minor numbers, but this is active monitoring and scanning of beacons. This works in the foreground, uh, and it gives us the best part of it is we don't just get notified when we see a beacon, we get some information that we can use in our application. And it, we get an enum back. 
uh, which is immediate, and it tells us if, how far we are away, right? And let me, let me show you exactly how this works. So Mike's going to hold this eye beacon. I'm going to pretend I'm the, I'm the uh, Android phone because I'm, I'm the Android, and he's over there. He's fancy. So when I'm far away, I enter, and I get notified I'm in a region, right? And I'm actively scanning for beacons. So now I'm far away. Now I'm pretty close. But now I'm really near, <laughs> right? So you can get really close and really great estimates of how far away your users are from this device. So it's not like NFC where you have to be right up on it and tap it. You have fine-grained control of what you want to do when your user is, is so close to this beacon. Now, these are just the devices that are emitting these signals. And there's a, a plethora of devices that can find them. So where we're deploying our apps to. So Mike, why don't you cover the ones that are, are good? Yeah, so um, with, with these devices, you, again, you need Bluetooth low energy. So any iOS 7, any, most devices that would run iOS 7 or above are all, in, at this case, would, would run iBeacon. So you'd be OK. You're in pretty good shape with iOS. On Android, it's, again, it's any device that would run Bluetooth LE or Bluetooth LE, and it would have to run Jelly Bean or KitKat above, and going forward into Android. Android LE, yeah, Now, correct. the window the window story, we want to talk a little bit about the window story. So it's a little different in the window story, in the Windows world. They're getting a little closer. It's, it's, it's tricky. It's a little I intricate, really. Yeah. So Windows Phone and Windows 8 devices, or 8.1 devices, they have Bluetooth low energy. They have Bluetooth built in. Uh, but the beautiful part about iBeacon is that we don't have to you know, pair anything. We just detect some beacons in the room. Unfortunately, they haven't unlocked this API. And it's really interesting because Bluetooth uh, uh, Low Energy was actually developed by a company that I shall not name. <coughs> no uh, that I, And that someone actually acquired. So that's, it's intriguing that they haven't figured out this process yet. So, uh, so what can we do with them? I, you gave one great example. So yeah, I gave that one example to, to, to describe one thing I, could, I thought of that you could use um, iBeacons with. But you know, J as James has been talking here so much, I've actually thought of a few others. Um, so you know, using this, just these three simple pieces of information, it can enable a variety of different interesting scenarios. And here's a few. You can enable home automation scenarios. Imagine you know, having one of these in your house or throughout your house. You walk into a room, and the lights turn on. Another idea is. Sporting events in large stadiums. Major League Baseball is using these um, today in all the parks throughout the United States. Now, I know Sh Greg Shackles is a huge uh, Yankees fan, but you know. That's right. Yeah, Greg Shackles is also a, a great, great Xamarin developer and a big fan of iBeacons, um, but we won't hold the Yankees yeah, against Yeah, we won't hold the Yankees against It's not his fault. So another scenario that in, it enables is in retail, um, in retail places where it can extend and enhance the customer loyalty experience. And this is a really interesting scenario. Say you had a, a pot with a flower in it or some kind of anything like this. You can have an application sticking the iBeacon onto the flower pot. You can have an application that when you get near the flower pot, it could alert the, the proximity to the flower pot, your application can be alerted to water the flowers. Yeah, I think that's a really interesting thought that you know, a lot of developers haven't gone at. There's, it's more than just retail. There's all these other ways of tracking and getting information that are helpful in our day-to-day -day lives. Absolutely. Now, uh, Mike, I know that uh, an Apple store recently opened up next to your house. Yeah, it's You're great. It's right down the street. Probably there every single day, I'm sure. Yeah, they know me already. Yeah, and, and since you have the Apple Store app installed, they also have implemented this in every single Apple Store across the, the US and around the world. So you get notified when you enter the store. It says, hey, welcome. Welcome to the store. Yeah. I'm sure you want to buy something. It's fantastic, and I do. Yeah, <laughs> and you do. <laughs> Uh, and in fact, uh, the iBeacons, for instance, are used in a scavenger hunt here at Evolve. This is an app that I created, the Evolve Quest, that you can find out right, right outside, that uses all iBeacon technology uh, here as well. So a lot of different use cases for creating and using iBeacons. So more than anything, let's just get into some demos and, and see how they work. Perfect. There we go. So this is my current setup. This is my this is beautiful user interface design, if I could say so myself. <laughs> I made this, this UI myself. Uh, now I have an iPhone here. Look at this fancy with an HDMI and everything. So we're going to use a real device since we have to use Bluetooth uh, on there. And we can make sure that that's on. Perfect. So here it is. What I want to do is kind of create this uh, find, find a beacon type game. So what I'll do is I'll at some point update this label, and we'll change the colors on it, just to get a, get a rough idea of what we have to do. 
Uh, so this is my, my iOS application, and I'm just going to go into the view controller. And this is a view controller like any other view controller we've ever seen. And in fact, it starts with the UI on top of it. So the first thing I'll do, I'm, I have a few snippets just because this is tedious. I don't think you want to watch me uh, you know, describe all these variables. But I'll, I'll step through them. Uh, for iOS, we take advantage of a location manager. And inside of core location, are these new things called core location beacon regions that we can specify. And in fact, core location also just has a beacon. So inside of the location manager, we're able to specify and create a beacon. So let's do that. And I'm actually going to move this a little bit further down, because I'm going to write all the code in my view to load here. So let's new up a few things. So I'm going to create a new location manager. There we go. Uh, the very first thing I'm going to do, this is a treat that we'll talk about in a little bit, but we will request uh, when in use authorization. So we have to prompt to say, hey, we're going to use some Bluetooth. We'll talk about that later. We're going to new up our beacon. So I'm going to create a beacon UUID. Now we're going to find a beacon. Mike's holding a beacon right there. And that beacon has a specific UUID that looks like this, looks like a, a GUID. And then it has a major and minor number. So we're going to detect just one beacon. That's the goal of this thing here. And the major number is 103 and 53865. And these are programmable. Uh, for most SDKs like Estimo, you can actually program them yourself, and they're linked to a cloud uh, scenario. So that way, other people can't reprogram them. So let's create a new uh, NSUUID. And this is just going to take in a string of UUID. And we'll create our beacon region. So this is the beacon region that I want to actually detect. Uh, beacon region. And there's a lot of overrides. So here we can see the very first one is just only detect all beacons with that UUID. So give me everything at the event. Or I can start specifying the major number and the minor number. And the API under the hood is handling this all for me to only retrieve back beacons with these properties. So I'm going to specify all of them. There's beacon UUID, major, uh, beacon minor. And then there's an identifier. It's just a friendly name for our beacons. Uh, so I just kind of follow the same naming convention of com.xamarin uh, like we've done in the past often. So there we go. We have beacon. We have our location. Uh, so what we want to do is say location manager dot uh, did. There's all these dids in here. So I can say did uh, range beacons, did start monitoring for, for regions. And the range beacons, every time we range, and the iOS device will keep ranging over and over again and detect these beacons, I'm going to get a call back. There we go. And we can see, this is interesting, we get a squiggly line. It's an iOS 8 only thing here. We'll talk about that in a bit. So now inside my, my arguments, I can see I have the region that was detected. It returns back the region that was uh, done, and also the beacon. Because the intriguing part is I could specify multiple regions here. It just doesn't have to be one. So let's first say if e.beacons.length, this is an array of beacons equals 0. Let's just get out of there. And we only know they're one, one beacon, and that's all we care about. So I'm going to grab the first beacon here. There we go. Now at this point, this beacon has a lot of, of, of properties. There's an accuracy, which, which actually gives me the proximity in meters, which is really nice. It's rough estimate, so don't really take it as you, you know 100% uh, where it is. Uh, but it, it, what we really care about is this proximity enum, and it's a core location proximity. And that's that near, immediate, or far away, or unknown. So I'm going to create a switch case. And I could create a switch case, and that would be very interesting for everybody here. Uh, or I could just go ahead and, and pull in that code. I think we've all seen a switch case enough times. There you go. So here's what I'm switching. I'm switching on that proximity, far, near, immediate, or unknown. And all I'm doing is doing a, uh, setting the background for the entire view. And the last thing I'll do is just to make sure that that is the correct beacon, so the region that I'm monitoring is coming back, I'll set that label in that fancy user interface I created to the identifier. And the very last part I need to do is actually start ranging for, for, uh, for these uh, beacons. So I can say monitoring or start ranging beacons. And I can queue up multiple regions as well. But I'm just going to do this one, which is going to be my beacon region. 
and that's the entire code base. Like, that's how easy this API is. Now, of course, we can do more complex stuff than besides setting the background color, but at the core level, that's all it is. So let's go ahead and uh, run this code. There's a compile it up, obviously. Now, Mike, Mike, Mike is probably in. Oh, probably don't get too close. Yeah. Look how close you are. Not that. Not I don't know. Close. Pretty close. Yeah. Let's estimate. Probably, probably near. We'll see. We'll move on. We're about to find out. You have the device. Good old deploy to device. Deploy to device. Please ensure your device is connected. I like that. Try it one more time here. Definitely like that. I like I like that it's asking me that, so that's good. That's interesting. It's definitely interesting. Let's try another cable real quick before I lose all hope on it. Well, James, is wh what it's going to do in this case is as I move closer and further from the device after it deploys, this event handler would get called as it, as it, it, while the, the, the API inside of iOS is ranging. And when this thing of the, identif the UUID, the major and the minor version that we specifically specified, gets closer within a radial distance, proximity, not a la exact location, to and far the from the device, you'd get this call back into the event handler, and it's going to go with the particular CL proximity, and then subsequently it'll run as code to change the UI. And hopefully we'll be able to get it up here in the, in the device here. I did. And you can I see did. That. Nice. I believe so. All right, so I figured out the problem here. There we go. So Cable. the problem happens to be with the HDMI. The one thing we didn't test. There we go. Hopefully we can get the HDMI back up there. There oh we my go. Goodness. So we were green. We're white. We're, we're green. green. We're doing something. I'm far Something's away. Happening. Let's get a little closer. We definitely updated the top. Let's we'll see if it's going to update now. If it's going to just be upset. We started it once. There we, there we go. go. Yellow. I'm getting warmer. Then I'm green. close. I'm close. And now you see now if I move farther away. I'm yellow. And it should turn to gray and we're yeah. gone. Let's see if it, how far it comes down here. Now it's just gone. It's just gone. I don't know. We'll give so it some in here. Did you like one? <laughs> You can try it out. So the interesting part is we saw a change from green to yellow after a few issues with the HDMI. But the interesting part is that it was kind of random. You saw Mike come really close to me. And this is an important part of the iBeacon protocol is that you can't rely on it being instant. That beacon is, is pulsating at a random interval. So we can't say it's instant every single time because it is Bluetooth just streaming and asking us over and over again. Uh, so that's an interesting part just to make sure. And you saw it live here in action. That's the best part that I love about live demos, because who knows? It exposes exactly what the API is doing. OK. So let's head back over to the slides real quick. Maybe. We get this there we go. There we Perfect. Go. Thank you. So. That was a great demo. Apple, again, they brought iBeacons to us in iOS 7. And going forward into iOS 8, they've enhanced the API with a bunch of new features. One great new feature they have is now you can have a lot more control to opt in as to when the beacons would actually get used within your application. Another thing they did to make it very transparent to users is on the lock screen, you have, you have visibility that an application is actually using iBeacon. So very transparent usage, really great support, and great new features have come to I, iOS 8 with iBeacons from Apple. Now, that all sounds great, but they kind of also broke everything. <laughs> Uh, so the issue here, and what I found when I was actually shipping the Evolve Quest application, is that they added some new properties that you saw me call, which is request when in use authorize or always. So if you want to always range in the background or only on the foreground, you have to request this. Now previously, oh, uh, iOS 7 would just prompt the user automatically. Now you have to also request authorization. We also have to add this a great little string property this, in the info the, plist. The, the fantastically named NS location when in use usage description. Perfectly intuitive. What could it, what could it else could it possibly be? Named? I mean, it's it's very elegant. It's, it's elegant, really elegant beautiful. name. Now, in fact, that's only one of them. If you want to do always, then of course you would replace when in use with always, which makes perfect sense. 
Now, I will say one thing about this is, is in iOS 7, it would prompt the user uh, to allow your location, which is weird, because I'm not really using their location. The app isn't tracking you in any way. Just the beacon, we're using Bluetooth. But since it lives in Location Manager, iOS assumes that you're tracking their location. So it's actually a good enhancement. Even though it broke probably every single update to iOS 8 app developers, uh, you're, you're able to specify a message here. So that's what this is here for. So when you actually use the Evolve Quest, it says, hey, this is a scary message, but here's what I'm actually going to do with that data. So iOS is great, but I think Android is better. <laughs> and there's some, now out of the box, uh, Android doesn't, it has Bluetooth low energy, but there's no API. Of course, there's the entire Bluetooth stack, which is that fancy flow chart that we skipped all over. But these these beacon creators, both Estimode and Radius and a few others, they obviously want you to buy their beacons, and they want you to use them inside of your applications. So for Xamarin developers, uh, we have uh, components on our component store for both Estimote and Radius networks, which allow you to use Estimotes and iBeacons, or any iBeacon, I should say, not just from their vendors. It's any uh, beacon uh, inside of your Xamarin Android applications. So let's hop over to an Android demo. All right. So we're back inside the same solution. And, and at this point, I haven't shared any code. Not at all. Not at all. Uh, but I'm still not going to. But you totally could. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I have inside of here, this is called iBeacon Simple, and I have an Android project. And the first thing that we'll, we'll notice here is that I have included the estimate uh, SDK component. It's also a new J that you can download. Uh, my, uh, our good friend Tom worked on this yep. uh, to bring the binding over. And that's also where the Radius networked and Chris Riesgo worked on that as well, which is awesome, a uh, Xamarin developer. And the only intricate part, which I kind of love Android, is that we're able to get all of our permissions up front. And, and we can hide all that from our users. Because when they install and they let us do anything we want, um, it's really nice. So here, uh, I'm going to set up a service in the background, which is how Estimote scans for their beacons. And then I just ask for all the permissions. I say, just let me do everything, because you don't care. Just, yep. just let me do it. <laughs> There's no prompts, no notifications. You, we don't have to worry about it as developers. I think that's the beautiful part. Nice. Yeah, it is nice. In fact, I mean, there's so many permissions, it's, it's pretty crazy. Uh, but this is an interesting flag I just wanted to talk about for, for two seconds, which if I enable this flag here, uses feature. So I've uses permission, but uses feature. If I, re if I require Bluetooth low energy in my app, it's the only way it will work. You can set this flag in Google Play, will we'll, we'll, uh, remove or will not allow anyone to install it that doesn't have Bluetooth low energy on their device. Uh, for the Quest application, for instance, I didn't use this flag because we have QR code scanner in the background, or a scanner that you can use, so a, a fallback, which is a nice way of using it. So I'm going to hop into the main activity. This code's already pre-canned because it's going to look exactly the same. The difference here is that I have a callback from the Estimote SDK, which is when my beacon manager is ready, it, we can actually start ranging. So this is going to look extremely similar to you. I have, a, I have a, Beacon ID and a UUID here. And this is the Estimote specific. So when you buy an Estimote, you can change the UUID later, but this is all of them out of the box. Uh, and that's it. So in this case, instead of just ranging for one, we happen to have a bunch of Estimotes bunch. here. As many as Look I at all these guys. Hands here. We have so many. Hold those up. A whole bunch, no, of, whole bunch beacons, of them. Right? So hopefully we can find all of them. And what we're going to do here is I create a new Beacon Manager, kind of like over in iOS. I specify a region, but this is an estimate region. And what's interesting here is I can, it requires a string and integers to be passed in, but I can pass in null for my major and minor. So that's what I do here. I pa pass in my UUID, and then I pass in some null attributes. So then it'll find all of them. It'll go ahead and find all of them. And as I would expect, when my beacon manager gets a ranging notification, I'm going to go ahead and update the background color here, no switch case, a bunch of ifs. We got to fix that up so it's a proper enum. But it is it's a sort of an enum of sorts. Uh, it's just a static. <laughs> we can see we have far, near, immediate. Not quite as elegant, sorry. Android, sometimes not quite as elegant. Uh, we set the background color. Uh, and then the first thing I do is how many beacons did I find? 
as well. I set the text property, so it's going to look very, very similar. So uh, automatically, what, what happens is this is going to start up the background service uh, when I uh, resume. So whenever I, and I, Android, I need to actually request, just kind of like I said, start ranging before. I'm going to say connect to the background service. And when that's ready, start ranging. So what Estimote is doing under the hood is they're running the service in the background, which means you could run a service talking to it in the background. Uh, and when it's ready to start communicating and range for beacons and notify your application, you can actually say, hey, I want to start ranging uh, for this region. So I could deploy this here, but we have, uh, let's see here, <coughs> my devices. But I'll plug in. Let's check this out here. <laughs> There we go, this is my big phone. Let's go ahead and make this a little bit smaller. It's just a screen mirroring application that I have. So I'm going to run this application, the same code that we see there. Beautiful user interface. And he's got 8, 11. Now go far, go away. Go. Go away. Go away. Let's see if we can get blue out of it. Go. Uh. So it's pretty good. This is the ranging distance that we can get. And we can see some are falling off now, <coughs> just here automatically. So it's only pulling an update from the last one. Keep, all right, here you go. Good. This is pretty cool, though. So I could actually detect all of these beacons from any distance. But I think it gets more intriguing. Uh, because what I could do is I could create, uh, on Android, there's all these emerging devices. And I could use iBeacons in those cases as well. Imag imagine running Estimote code and iBeacon code on a Google Glass. Or even wow. better, what about on the watch? You can do that on a watch? I could do it on a watch. Wow, that's pretty impressive. Amazing. So that's amazing. I mean, just imagine now, this is, we had just thought about this. Uh, if the Quest, you just tapped your watch. So we, we could actually do that. Yeah, we sure could. Let's go ahead and plug back in the watch here. There's my, this is my, uh, my LG. So it's very nice for development for it. has a nice little drop down. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and oh, so walk 200 steps today. Very active. So I'm going to go ahead and w launch this application. And there we go. All the beacons, again, the same code is being run on the Wear watch, except for I put it in a Wear project. It should be able to range, too. That's pretty good. Yeah, looks pretty well. And we can take a look at that code as well. I just have a Wear project. We saw here is my Wear project that I've created. And the code is going to look exactly the same, uh, except for I have a different background that I'm setting for my Android Wear application. So the exact same code. Now, at this point, it opens up a world of possibilities. Once I have this information, I could do something like the Quest game, where I can go ahead and detect specific regions at a time and actually display that information. Which is what you did. Yeah. So let's hop back over to the slides real quick. Perfect. So we've seen that we can do it on iOS. We can also implement this on Android. And hopefully at one point in the future, we can enable this functionality on Windows Phone. Sure. But, but I think what's really intriguing is what developers do next with it. Whether it's home automation, whether it's something like MLB's rolling out, Macy's is rolling this out to every single store in the United States, we're going to see a prolif proliferation of all of these devices and estimates and eye beacons and radius networks, all of these different companies coming together to actually enable developers uh, to create awesome context-aware applications. Now, these were just very simple examples. The entire Quest application uh, that you're running out there will be open source after the conference. So you can see how I did it. Uh, in fact, we also have some stuff running. Yep, we have, and also if some folks may have already gone to the Darwin Lounge. Well, one of the mini hacks uses iBeacons. There's an iOS version and an Android version. We also have a few blog posts we've written about it up on the Xamarin blog. We have Chris in the front row here who did some nice work on bringing this to Android. A you know, big hand for Chris over here in front of Chris Dreisel. And um, yeah, um, so. Yo, and with that, we'll just open it up for questions and answers if anyone has any. If you could go up to the mic real quick, we'll just go ahead and take those. I'm going to go around and give some folks a... So and I'll repeat the questions as well for everybody. I just had a question. I did some work um, before with it, and, um, and I saw on the slide for iOS 
that you can do it when the app is running or if it's in the background, but does that mean that if the app has been terminated, if you're like a chronic app closer, um, mm -hmm. is there any way to get notification at that point? So uh, the, the question here was what happens after my user actually closes off and exits the application and actually force close on iOS? Now on iOS, as far as my knowledge goes, uh, your application is dead at that point. Uh, and is that, is that, would you say that's correct? Yeah. So yes, yeah, it's dead at that point, so you can't really be notified, as far as I know. Right, so there's, so it can't like, it's not like a, can do almost like a push, it's not monitoring in the background, or do a push notification to kind of do something. So basically it's, it's, it's dead. Run to an extent into your application with the user's right. interaction. Yeah. So yeah, but it's just like any other backgrounding scenario. And yeah, you're not like getting special privileges because you're running this code. Now on Android, of course you can, because Android's awesome, <laughs> and you just run it in a background service, and who cares? Yeah. Right? And and you want to respect because maybe you don't want to you want to kick this intent service off every 15 minutes, 30 minutes. It really depends. Uh, I would say for me, what I would do is I would probably actively range just for regions. When I've entered a region, I would start really scanning and hopefully launch the application, put up a notification. I, I think it's actually bad for best practices and best and worst practices. I think in the background, definitely region monitoring. You don't on Android want to start always be ranging for beacons all the time. You don't want to kill your user's battery. Even though it's Bluetooth LE and it is low energy, I mean, if you're running this thing nonstop, I yeah. mean, you're not really going to, it's not going to be the best experience. Yeah. Well, you just answered my question. So what is the power consumption? The power consumption, so on classic Bluetooth is about one milliwatt. Uh, and then Bluetooth low energy is, is anywhere from all the way down to 0.01 milliwatt. Yeah, it's it really is an order of magnitude. Low. Yeah, it's an order of magnitude of, uh, of the power of the device. What is that Bluetooth LE chip going off? They're mostly all just Broadcom chips, I'm assuming at this point, kind of the same stack. Uh, but they could be different. <laughs> now, the actual beacons, uh, when you create them and set them up, there's an RS, RSSI, yeah. D, uh, RSSI. RSSI, which is like the power level that it's putting off. Uh, so you can amplify the beacons themselves, uh, so, which means that those beacons, the lifespan of them, could be anywhere from two to three years to four days. I mean, yeah. if you really are pumping that puppy up, I mean, they, you they don't can really And they can reduce power because the, the, the use case is, is very specific. It's this proximity thing. Whereas you know, classic Bluetooth in general, you can do other things like you're transmitting a lot of, you can transmit a lot of other forms of data or voice like you do when you talk on your phone and whatnot. So it's a little bit different. Yeah, and it's really fire and forget at, to the beacon. It doesn't know anything. <coughs> uh, there's no two-way communication between the device uh, out of the box. You know, SMO does offer that uh, as well. So let's uh, rephrase my question. Uh, when I start using these APIs, uh, the battery lifetime, so if my phone usually lasts one day on a charge, what happens when I start using the application with this? You shouldn't see an impact really at all. I mean, it should be negligible. However, if you have 100 applications all doing it at the same time. So I think as application developers, we have the responsibility to ensure that our applications aren't doing something like that. We'll go over here to the right side. How uh, platform dependent are the, or independent are the libraries that you use? Like, can I use a Gimbal uh, brand iBeacon with those li same libraries, or are they really yeah. brand specific? So on iOS, as, as James showed you in an example, that wasn't a, that wasn't a third party API. We're just using um, we're just using Apple's frameworks, core location to do the ranging, as he said. So that's just the, the location frameworks that had been there before. That was nice that they built it that way for iOS developers because they built it in an API that was already familiar with people using that. So we're ranging in that case for, you know, it, they have to support, they have to su support the protocol that, that Apple is putting up, but yes. the Estimote iBeacons aren't, there's nothing special you have to use. They're, they have an SDK, but there's nothing special you have to use on iOS. On Android, on Android now, it's a, a, a little different. You go through SDK, there's SDKs yeah. and components in our store. For Estimote, there is an SDK, so you have a similar API, but to me, it, it's already built in out of the box. Uh, Estimote does add some extra perks uh, in there as well for other communication, like their, their beacon specifically can detect temperature and motion if you connect to it, uh, so you could do something like that. Now on Android, the one thing that's really important is I specified that UUID. Now it happens to be the Estimote UUID, but it could be any beacon. Right. It doesn't matter, to be honest with you. Uh, the, 
even though Estimote, they obviously want you to buy their product, and same with Radius Network, they created these SDKs for any beacon because that's the kind of world they live in. I think if you flash, the, if any company you know, creating these SDKs flashes their name in front of their users enough times, they're probably going to buy the product if it's good. And, right. and, and they actually, Estimote has apps in the, in, on all the platforms that you could use to, to test against their SDK. It was one of the things we, we yeah, showed there. On you I, can, yeah. You can, on, on Android too, in, um, in iOS. On Android and iOS, if you search for Estimote right now, you will, you will find their uh, actual application used to program and detect beacons around, which is pretty cool. Yes, yeah, pretty neat. Yeah. Now, I think what's interesting is, is really, when you think of the core technology that I showed off, it really wasn't too many lines of code on iOS or Android. So for instance, in the Quest application, it was shared about 60% of logic between all, um, all three different operating systems. Because really, I'm just detecting this beacon code, passing it to my view model, and then it's handling, what do I do next? So that's what's interesting there. Let's go over here, and then back over here. We've got three minutes. So. Um so these devices, like one, can we have one that works for both Android and iPhone and? Oh sure. No. Yeah, absolutely. And that's absolutely. what we're doing here on stage. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah okay. So oh, so I'm every single beacon on. around yeah. uh, can be work can be used on for a scanned on any device. It doesn't matter. And then. What's the cost of these things? It's a good question. Uh, so everyone's, everyone are a little bit different, so the cost for each of them. Obviously, in turning an iOS device in, which is just a few lines of code, it's a few hundred dollars. An Estimote iBeacon, if you buy retail, that's going to be that one about $30 a piece. Radius, which is USB powered, is about $20 to $30 based on your bulk order. If you're buying a lot of them, obviously, you'd work with the company. Those nearable ones, which are those stickers that come off, those are going to be $10 a piece. They're 10 for 100 and those are available now. So about $30 in your hand right now. And can these be recharged? So <laughs> that's a good question. <laughs> and actually, we, we didn't pass out some because I've slit them open to actually replace the battery. Uh, they fixed that. <laughs> so uh, yeah, so we th yeah, they're going to be open. redesigning it uh, in the future as well. The, when they shipped the original est uh, estimates out, they kind of set them at different ranges. So some of them died in two months. That wasn't smart. So now all of them out of the box last for three years, <laughs> about, because they're <laughs> low power. But for those estimates, you can't replace the batteries. Think of them like a, any Apple product um, out there. Uh, but um, like Radius networks, for instance, they're almost like a Bluetooth dongle. That's just USB power. So that's the interesting part. Now, there's so many vendors, and you can use it on so many SDKs. You can pick the beacon that's right for you. But like at Macy's, right? How many of these would be deployed? I and mean, how can they go collect all of these, charge them, and put them back again? Yeah, I don't think they're the, really charging them. I think that the Macy's is, I, I can't speak for Macy's, but I think yeah. the, the people that are putting them now, they're treating them as almost throwaways. As just a, yeah, to them, I think, and, yeah. And then they would dispose it and put another one that's yeah. low, low, low enough cost that they can do it that way. And it does last long enough. Imagine if, if, imagine if you, know, you, you come to Estimo and you're like, hey, I would like to buy 10 million Estimotes, right? They're probably going to cut you a pretty good deal. No, I'd imagine. <laughs> so uh, th that's kind of thing. Also, in an Apple store, for instance, yeah, Apple store store. every single iOS device is actually the beacon. They don't have beacons right. around. Just the iOS devices in the store naturally well, so are the beacons. Yeah, if you have an, so if you have an iPhone or an iPad, you could get started programming against it without having one of these right now because, uh, as we mentioned, you can make that device be an iBeacon. Or your Mac. Device or a Mac, can that's be a true. beacon itself. This, we don't need one of these. Not to do development. If you have iOS, the iOS device or a Mac can actually be a beacon, okay. right? Because it has Bluetooth low energy on it, so it which is also can do some interesting scenarios in its own right as well. So yeah, well, either way. And one last question. Um, you did say that there's no two-way communication, but can we embed any piece of data in this to say who this guy is or where this guy is? That's or? that's the data, that that major number and minor number, that's what that that guy in your hand has right there. And he's okay. transmitting that data. That's programmable by the company. Uh, okay. They have a special protocol that does that entire workflow for you. But think of it as a, a, a simple device that doesn't communicate at all, and all it does is shout. Just as I said, it just, I'm here. That's all it does. That's okay. all it knows. If you think of it that way, it's a device that shouts that I'm here, and your application can detect it. That's how you think about it. Then your application does the network yeah. and gives the, the user yeah. the, ex, you know, the customer. We the can experience. meet up after we're out of time if you have a question. Yeah, okay. And thanks, Excellent. everyone, and have amazing Evolve. Oh. Thanks.